and welcome to the Business and Finance Executive Insight Series, where we speak to leaders about their insights into success, strategy, and overcoming challenges. I'm Nancy Fallon, and I'm delighted to be joined by John Jordan, Chief Executive of Ornua. Ornua is a company which is best known for its Kerrygold brand, and equally as a leading exporter from Ireland. It's been in business for more than 60 years and has had much success throughout that time. And the most recent success is being nominated and awarded Business and Finance Company of the Year. John, I'm wondering, can you tell me a little bit about how you have achieved that success and the strategies which you've implemented in Ornua to achieve that success? Sure. And maybe, Nancy, just to first say thank you to both Business and Finance and KPMG for the recognition uh, for Ornua as Company of the Year. It's a, it's a real honour for us, a great privilege, and has created great excitement within our 3,000 employees. Um, and as I say, look, it's really nice that Orno were 60 years in business, uh, and that in itself says something uh, for a company to be in existence for 60 years. We started out as a semi-state body, and when Ireland joined the EU in 1972, we became a cooperative. Um, and it's a great uh, business to be involved in. I think what's sustained our success is probably two things. One, fundamentally, we're based on Irish dairy. And I've said it many a time before, Irish farming families produce the best quality milk in the world, bar none. The best quality milk in the world. It's also then processed in the cooperatives around Ireland, who are the shareholders of Ornoa, in world-class facilities. And I've travelled the world and seen dairies everywhere. What we have here in Ireland, the co-op structure, is as good, if not better, than everywhere else in the world. That then creates a fantastic product range for Ornoa to sell. And we're very fortunate that consumers recognise and taste and feel that difference. So starting point is our product base, uh, which is fantastic. Beyond that, we just try and keep it simple. Keep it simple and focus on where we can win. And particularly as you grow as a business, and uh, this year we'll finish our sales at about 3.6 billion euro. Five years ago, that was closer to 2 billion. So it's an incredible growth story. But as you grow and organically and through acquisition, businesses become very complex. So we really try and keep it simple and focus on where we can win and where we can make a difference. Very interesting. And, and, and you mentioned, I suppose, um, the team of people that you have in Ornua and I guess 3000 plus strong team. It's a huge team. And I know you've been with Ornua for more than 20 years at this stage, which is a long time. And I guess the question that I have is and would like to understand a little bit more in is, what kind of do you think you brought to the organization along? You've been in so many different roles. What are the key characteristics that you brought to the organization? And I've been very fortunate. I joined Ornu as a graduate trainee, and uh, that was actually 1993, um, which is two lifetimes ago for, for a lot of people. Um, and I've been really lucky. Um, I've worked with some fantastic people. I've also got to travel the world. I mean, how many companies do you get to, to work with where you literally travel the world? Ornua is an Irish company, but 99.5% of our sales are outside of Ireland, which is an incredible uh, success story. Our biggest market in the world is Germany uh, and, and the US coming very close behind that. What have I brought? Um, I suppose I've brought maybe uh, two attributes that I, that I actually genuinely reflect on. One is I've brought history. So the fact that I've been in the business for so long, I've brought some of what's behind us um, and we've built it on, on the on the... I suppose the foundation of those that go before us and, and, and 60 years is a hell of a long time for a company to be in business. Um, so I've brought some of that and that's great in terms of context, maybe understanding, but also the culture of the organisation and sustaining those, those values within the organisation. Um, and I think the other thing that I, that I bring, and I'm really lucky in this way, I've brought passion. Um, passion because I love my job. I really, really love what I do. I actually get out of bed in the morning with a spring in my step and actually go to work happy every day. Um, I'm not sure if you check my family from my home happy every day, but uh, because obviously <laughs> things happen. But but I love what I do, so and I bring that passion, and and I think people sense that. Um, you know, when we go on holidays as a family, uh, pre-COVID we went to Florida, three teenage boys, and you know typically they'd be saying, "Where's Dad?" You know, we'd go into a supermarket, we go to every supermarket, we go, "Where's Dad?" We're down the butter aisle fixing up Kerrygold. You know, anyone that works in our new will tell you the same. They travel the world, they see Kerrygold, a bit of pride, but they all stop at the shelf and fix it up and make sure it's, it looks well for consumers. So I think history and passion, Nancy, were the two things that really have brought to the company. Yeah, and, and it's funny talking about passion because 
I suppose it does, it backs up the whole Kerry Go brand in many ways because it's obviously such a successful brand, such a ubiquitous brand that is really known in households really throughout the world in many ways. And I suppose what's behind that is the belief in it and all of the support and the history that goes behind it. So mm. it's interesting, the two key points that you talk about as areas which you brought to the organisation, I think very much reflect in the brand as well. And I guess that brand has been so important in driving the success of Ornua internationally along with many others but I suppose what would be your advice to companies that are setting out on that road who maybe have a, a foundling product that is is coming out of Ireland and are trying to develop a brand internationally how mm. can they go about doing that and maybe I'll answer that in two ways again Nancy just a little bit about us and then then maybe some lessons we've learned so um, Kerry Gold is Ireland's first ever billion euro food brand again a phenomenal success and a billion at retail sales and when you talk to global fmcgs the really big blue chips around the world they talk about their billion euro or billion dollar brand portfolio and we own one of those yeah. so it's an incredible success um and i was very fortunate when we hit that billion i actually got to meet uh, uh, sir anthony o'reilly who was the first ceo of yeah. ornua or board bonya as it was in the time yeah. uh, and it was great listening to him and uh, he was telling the story about launching Kerrygold, and they launched into the Liverpool and Manchester markets uh, in the 60s. Now, great exploration in terms of exporting out of Ireland a food product in the 60s, but the scale of it is incredible today when you think the ambition was Liverpool and Manchester, um, and today we're exporting to over 110 countries around the world. So a phenomenal um, journey for the brand to have gone through. Um, and it's a brand that's just amazing in the way people engage with it. Um, even in the last few weeks, I'll take weeks, um, uh, and I'll, I'll get it wrong on the social media platform, so I won't say, but it was either TikTok or Instagram. Uh, Courtney Cox uh, called out Kerrygold in baking. Uh, Chloe Kardashian called it out. Oprah Winfrey had a cooking demonstration with her girlfriends at home and had Kerrygold on the, on the table. And as recent as uh, about the 16th, 15th, 16th of Jan this year, uh, Twitter trended with Kerrygold. There was a story on Twitter posted by an individual where she had experienced Kerrygold for the first time and labelled it as Buttergate. It had a million views on Twitter, a million views to talk about a food brand. Um, so our consumers are incredibly passionate about the brand and that's because it's a great product. So go back to where it starts. We're really good with the product. If I was to, to look at, and I've talked to, to many Irish companies, uh, particularly smaller companies looking to export, I'd say again two things. Um, one is be really confident of the product you're putting out there. Okay? You have to really believe that this product has a home within a consumer uh, population. And the second thing is own it. And um, very often you'll see stories um, covered in, uh, particularly in, the, in, in our sector, where companies will say, we've launched a product into America and we're listed on a shelf in America. Uh, US is a huge market. It's actually relatively easy to put a product on the shelf. Retailers will put plenty of products on shelves. But then you ask, well, how did that happen? Well, we met somebody at, at a fair or a, uh, we met a distributor and we've handed over the products to them and we send out the orders and they're taking care of it. My own view is that has a limited scalability. So they won't have the same passion for your product. Um, Ornua owned a distribution company in the US. I ran it for a while. They managed 60,000 items. The only people that really believe in your product and your brand are your people. Um, so if you're really serious and go back to keep it simple and focused, if you're really serious about a market, about export, uh, I believe you should own it. You should invest in putting people on the ground and go to sell and tell your story and tell, tell, uh, tell it only as you could. Yeah, I know. And that makes sense. And that again goes back to, I suppose, your point around your people and, you know, the passion that they have and the importance that it has to the business. And I'd also like to say that you did very well with all the names on social media. I think you take them all also very well done. And I suppose we focused on all the, the great success that Ornua has had. But I guess, as you say, trading for over 60 years, um, it's a long time. There's obviously been lots of challenges that you as a group will have faced and I suppose more in more recent times we've seen COVID as a challenge how has COVID impacted or new and what impact has it had yeah hasn't it changed everybody's life um and it's funny it, it's triggered more in our new I think than just looking at COVID and I go back to pre-COVID uh, it's funny the way we all talk pre and post COVID mm. like it's it's like the clock reset but pre-COVID one of the big challenges facing our and in fact Ireland and our food sector in particular was Brexit 
So Brexit was looming. UK is a huge dist- uh, trading partner for Ireland. Uh, Pre-Brexit, 30-ish percent of our business, our newest business was in the UK. We've uh, five manufacturing sites, employ a thousand people, strategically very important for us. When I look back and reflect on that now, we had 18 months to two years of preparation for it. We had a team from the UK, a team from Ireland, cross-functional team, meeting every couple of months, briefing uh, senior execs, talking to customers, making preparation plans, scenario A, B and C. We seemed to have an eternity to do it. We felt under pressure at the time. You then rolled forward to March 2020 and suddenly COVID hits and you don't have time to debate it. You all had to, we all, all of us all over the world had to get up and walk out of our offices and, and work from home and try to keep our businesses running. Um, we also, affecting our business then, had the what we call the Trump tariffs. So there was an air uh, uh, dispute between Boeing and Airbus. So nothing to do with poor little Ornu or food. But that ended up in the WTO um, arbitration court between the US and Europe. And the US were given uh, the right to impose import duties on European product into the US. And the US government looked at product that they thought would uh, have the most impact and they chose butter as one of those products. They put a 25% tariff on all European butter going into the US. 90% of all European butter going to the US is carry gold. Uh-huh. So in effect, it was a 25% tariff on carry gold. So you had COVID, you had, a, you had a, the Trump tariffs, we had the Suez Canal blocking and, and supply chain being disrupted. Um, and all of those changing consumer behaviours that came with it. So a very tumultuous few years. The outcome, I think, has made us more resilient as a business and far more agile. We've responded to those. On the plus side, um, what happened during COVID, and we all did it, I'm sure it happened at home with you, Nancy, you were at home, eating at home all the time. So home consumption pretty much went to 100% in most countries. Uh, we all then got a bit bored and fed up, so we did things like baking um, and great Kerry Gold was great for baking. So consumption at home skyrocketed. That meant retail shopping, which was really good for our business, particularly on the Kerry Gold and indeed other brands that we have, Pilgrim's Choice in the UK and private label where we supply that. The downside was our food service business and our, our ingredients business suffered a little bit. Thankfully, post COVID, they've uh, rebalanced and rebounded a bit. But overall, COVID was very positive for Anua. And what we've then managed to do is post-COVID maintain that momentum. So how do you sustain it and maintain it and bring all that was good through that experience and maybe change some of the things that weren't great? And, and how have you managed to sustain it? You know, how, how have you done that? Um, again, I suppose some of that is, is um, back to our fundamental philosophy of keeping things simple. And one of the examples uh, I could give is in the UK, uh, if you walk into a supermarket and buy a packet of cheese, sliced, grated or a block, we supply about 40% of that market in the entire UK. So great outlet for Irish cheese into the UK. One of our customers, um, retail customers, they give us 12 hours notice for delivery. So it's a really short, tight timeline, really tight supply chain. Uh, we were producing about 65 items for them. And within a matter of weeks of COVID happening, their demand doubled. So they were ordering 100 and then they wanted 200. You can't have that level of spare capacity in the factory. If you did, you'd probably run out of business. So we had a little bit of spare capacity, which we filled. And again, we were able to sit down with the team, our team and the retailer and say, look, if we got rid of half of the items and the more complex ones and lo- slower selling ones, we could actually make the top half pretty much double the volume. And they did. Um, so we actually did that with the retailer. We sat down, something that would have taken years to do without the environment that we were in for COVID. It benefited our business because we were able to supply the demand. It benefited the retailer because they didn't have empty shelves. Consumers came in and bought because their shelves are full. And post it, it's a lesson we've we've carried forward in terms of how do we range, rationalise more aggressively with retailers to the benefit of both. So, simple example maybe of it. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. And I think it is something you hear. COVID obviously was very difficult, but it has allowed a huge amount of change happen very, very quickly. Mm. Some of it good, some of it bad. But yeah, that's an example of where... You know, obviously a very positive way in order to, to take yeah. a bit of an opportunity out of what was a very, very significant challenge. Yeah, I think we were also looking, Nancy, that, that in the preceding few years, we had invested reasonably well in technology. Yeah. Um, I think if, if COVID had happened seven or eight years ago, we'd have struggled. How do you lift your desktop home? We had already gone to the stage where pretty much everything was in the cloud. Everyone's on laptops. Uh, telephones were through the internet and we were using Teams and Skype. So I think that investment that some of our 
uh, the, the execs in previous roles made really helped us through that so uh, we were we were very fortunate absolutely yeah absolutely and i suppose when you, you mentioned some of the challenges you mentioned the tariffs you mentioned brexit i suppose brexit obviously did create a lot of complexity looking forward now what do you see as some of the biggest challenges that an exporter sitting in ireland is going to face yeah i think there's there's probably um certainly from our sector there, there's well there's one that's impacting everybody which is clearly the short-term challenge we have or maybe it's medium-term challenge of inflation so the cost of goods cost of inputs cost of energy has gone up for everything that's being produced and we're seeing that across uh, every sector uh, you see it in the inflation numbers here in ireland and across europe and indeed in the us and to be talking about inflation rates in ireland have tempered back to i think 8.6 percent was the latest figure but tempered back to 8.6 so there's a challenge fundamentally there for consumers who won't be getting pay increases of 8.6% um, and how consumers respond with the money in their pocket and what they buy. We cannot live or expect them to buy and live the same way they did uh, maybe 12, 18 or 24 months ago. So there'll be some decrease in demand from a consumer side. Where and what they decide to buy will impact all of us. So consumer demand is one. The other big one which has and it's, I think it's again there's something to be looked at as to why it came out so well or so strongly in COVID. The other piece is the environmental and sustainability piece. It has catapulted, catapulted to the top of every consumer's agenda. Consumers and our customers, big blue chips, asking us and talking to us about our sustainability agenda and what we're doing. Um, so I think that's going to be interesting. Again, I, I say it with a little bit of a wry smile. Um, I, I absolutely believe we have to do what's right. But we get this demand and pressure from consumers and i saw it in my own home three teenage sons who were sitting at home getting amazon deliveries every day of the week mm -hmm. came in the same brown box and they'd ask about the carbon footprint of ornua and they never once thought about the carbon footprint of the stuff that they kept getting every day and then would return the next day and get re-delivered the following day so consumers are funny in terms of the way they don't often think about their own uh, the, the standards they hold themselves to but will hold companies and brands to higher standards and um, so i think that's an interesting one on the positive side of that, certainly from an Irish perspective, um, Ireland is the most carbon efficient producer of dairy and beef indeed in the Northern Hemisphere. So we're starting from a really good position. We still have to do better. And it's interesting, I think, if you look at some of the media coverage in the last maybe six, nine, 12 months um, and how it's portrayed, these stories should be told where farming families are actually going to be the heroes of the story. Mm -hmm. They're not the villains, the heroes. If you talk to them and listen to them, what they want to do is take a farm they own today and hand it down to the next generation in better condition and more sustainable position than they got it. So they need help on two things. One is the science mm -hmm. and some funding to transition from one stage to another. And I think Ireland, one of the benefits with Ireland is how well connected we are as a country, particularly in the food sector and food is so important food dairy agriculture is so important in ireland we now have a legislation so we have a climate action bill it's in law in terms of the standards ireland will achieve they're not wishful hopes and ambitions there are now legal limits that we as an industry must meet over the next five and and seven years so i think we're in a really good place and i'd be very positive about taking on certainly the climate challenge for 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 ireland uh, and the inflation one as i say it'll be interesting to see how that develops over the next 12 to 24 months yeah, interesting. And, and I suppose the inflation one is, is an interesting one for Ornua because you have a premium brand. And I presume dealing with that in the context of an inflationary environment is more difficult than dealing with, a, I suppose, a brand that is not premium and you can just cut price on it, I guess. Yeah, and um, it's interesting. It depends then a lot on, on markets. So um, uh, so th there's a lot of psychology, and I'm not the expert on it, so I'm treading into very <laughs> dangerous territory uh, if some of my colleagues were listening. There's a lot of psychology around how consumers react at store. So if you're feeling a bit penny pinched and you're, you're not going out and therefore you're buying in retail to consume at home, yes, you'll watch what you buy, you're conscious of, of, of what you're spending, but you have a tendency to treat yourself. Yes. So you might buy a slightly better bottle of wine because you're staying in on Friday not, night, night and not going out. Um, and in some markets, Kerrygold falls into that treat luxury item. Um, so there are some markets where we actually will probably still see very significant sustained growth um, and some where some of those consumers who are a bit more cost conscious may trade down um, but again we'll see we're still very very confident and very ambitious uh, it took us uh, about 50 it took us 57 years to become a billion euro brand uh, we believe we can hit 2 billion within 5 years of that
Um, so really ambitious in terms of the growth we're looking for for Cargo globally. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic yeah. number, and it will be a fantastic <laughs> achievement. And I'm sure, I'm sure you will achieve it. Um, you you mentioned, I guess, the sustainability point, and I suppose it's something when you think about the agri food business and sector in Ireland that absolutely comes to the front of the mind. And I suppose one thing you mentioned is obviously we have goals. The the Climate Action Bill is there. We know what's required. I mean, in terms of what policymakers can do, is it around the point of you mentioned funding, but it is it also to allow farmers as you mentioned in that context which obviously feeds then into your product and then what that product and how the consumer sees that product is it about giving them a game plan an action plan because I suppose as you say we have targets to meet but it's hard for farmers on the ground to actually know um, how to do that so in terms of what policy makers can do is it around helping farmers to achieve that or is it more broader to to keep on facilitating the ongoing growth of a sector mm. which I suppose is the backbone of the country being the agri-food sector uh, that's an interesting perspective Nancy and, and I think look the um, again I get to travel still get to travel yeah. internationally which is great um, and many of our international competitors look with great envy at Ireland um, we compete uh, as well as anybody in the global stage, but we're a very well connected industry. So the co-ops in Ireland, the farming industry, the farm uh, lobby groups, um, government, uh, industry bodies, extremely well connected in terms of being on the same page about representing Ireland uh, abroad internationally and holding us to ourselves to a high standard and understanding the importance that food, dairy and agriculture plays in our society. I mean, there are 18,000 dairy farming families in rural Ireland, which are basically small businesses. Mm-hmm. So they need to be sustained for the fabric of Irish society, Absolutely. keeping people and keeping those families on their farms, allowing them to invest in their farms, invest in their children's education, go on a holiday, buy a car, whatever they need to do. Um, the government have been, I think, very brave and very correct in putting in legislation. They've also been very positive in terms of the way they've engaged with industry in the broadest sense. Um, in saying what needs to be done or what can we as an industry collectively do to get to those targets. And again, it breaks down fundamentally into two pieces. One, uh, and you touched on it, is what has to happen inside the farm gate in terms of farming practices. And Ireland is very fortunate we have some of the best scientific uh, brains in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, When you look at the research that's done in Ireland, particularly through Chagask, um, what can actually practices, practical things can happen at farm level. We need to get that science out to farms and, and, and get farmers to in, engage in those practices. And they're very straightforward and very simple, at many of them. There's further science coming around things like feed additives that will help a cow reduce the methane she's producing. That science needs to be invested in and accelerated. And the third piece then is if there is an impact on a farming family's income because they have to manage their farm slightly different, how do we encourage them and bridge the the, the gap until they get to a future state and, and have a steady state income. So it's really important in terms of, I think, science and funding, but sustaining the fabric of Irish society with farming families throughout rural Ireland. Yeah. Well, no, that, that and they're up for the challenge, which is the great part. Absolutely, no, it, it does seem to be. And as you say, there does seem to be a wish to have that asset and pass it on to the next generation. Yeah. So they want to make it work. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's I, the, the, some of the pieces, the nicest thing I think um, I get to do as, as CEO of Ornua so the NDC and Kerrygold sponsor the um, Farming Family of the Year Awards and um, I get to go to that and there, there's usually 10 or 12 farming families from around the country. They're the best. They are the elite farming families in Ireland and um, one of them gets crowned Farming Family of the Year. Um, but the stories that they tell are just phenomenal and every time they come, there's at least two or three generations. Yeah. There are grandparents, there's parents and there's kids working on it. Um, The most recent family that won it, uh, four daughters, uh, a husband and wife running the farm. They only got into uh, dairy, they were in beef previously, uh, three years ago. Um, And they all play a role in the farm. um, And they all want to passionately develop and build a farm that will sustain for generations. So I think I love that. I love love listening to the farmer stories. And nobody wants sustainable farming more than Irish farming families. Yeah, no, no, that makes sense. And as you say, we're we're coming from a good place anyway in Ireland in terms of how we do produce our our food product. And I suppose you you've chatted about the the two billion aspiration in five years time. And I guess the the question then comes well in terms of the opportunities that you see for our newer. And it probably touches on a lot of what we've already covered. But what are the key opportunities that you see for the for our newer going forward? 
Yeah, we, we're, we've um, gone through an incredible growth journey over the last few years and um, we're looking to accelerate that further. So we've just launched a, a new five-year plan um, signed off just before Christmas, um, which is a very aggressive growth plan out to 2027. Um, the other part of our business is B2B, business to business, where we're supplying ingredients to food manufacturers and global QSRs, quick service restaurants, pizzerias. Uh, that's an area where we're having fantastic traction, um, really adding value to Irish dairy ingredients and, and growing our business with some of the biggest blue chip companies in the world. That's harder for people to get their heads around and understand, um, but uh, in an Irish context, um, uh, Apache pizza uh, mm -hmm. would frequently uh, contain our newest cheese in the top of it, or indeed in the rope uh, in, in a stuffed crust, and we do that internationally. Um, on terms of the brand, uh, the accelerated excitement uh, is just phenomenal. We're the number one brand in Germany. If you go into a retailer in Germany, the most frequently scanned barcode through the till, and I won't make the sound, is <laughs> Kerrygold 250 gram butter. <laughs> So the most frequently scanned barcode in the entire German retail landscape is Kerrygold Butter, which is amazing. If you go to the US, Kerrygold is now the number two brand in the entire United States, and it's double the price of the number one brand. The really nice thing is we could double in the US and double again, and we still wouldn't be as big as number one. So the, 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 the number one brand is huge, but that gives us uh, room for growth. So they're really exciting. Um, I think in terms of uh, one of our biggest challenges around enabling that growth, Nancy, is going to be access to talent. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that globally. There's a shortage of people in the workforce. Um, if there is to be a, a slight um, positive taken out of a global recession is an easing of labour force. So access to talent, access to people is really important for us in terms of supporting and underpinning that growth. Um, I think they're the big challenge, but I think it's a very exciting few years ahead for our new again. Sound, very much it sounds like it. Well, it's been really interesting chatting to you and hearing about the Ornua story. And once again, I'd just like to congratulate you and your team on being awarded Business and Finance Company of the Year. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Nancy.